The next item on the order paper is a motion on the BBC Spotlight programme on illegal waste disposal. The Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and the proposer of the amendment will have 10 minutes to propose and five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. I am conscious that the Minister has indicated during question time last week that there is ongoing criminal investigations. I would therefore ask members to be particularly careful to say nothing that might prejudice that investigation or any resulting legal proceedings. Clark, please read the motion. That this Assembly recognises the issues raised in the recently broadcast BBC Spotlight investigation into illegal waste disposal and other irregularities, and calls on the Minister of the Environment to establish an independent public inquiry into waste disposal in the North West, to ensure that public confidence is restored and to allay concerns that other illegal waste disposal sites remain undetected. I call Cahill Boylan to move the motion. Agar Mogat and Lash Khan Kolya, Bowailam Lorch, Evavar, and Ruin Shaw, August and Lassu. Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak in favour of the motion and also the amendment, but I would like to add the comments in relation to um, the amendment. Whilst in principle we support the amendment, this motion is about the activities that was carried out in the North West. So, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Deputy Speaker, I welcome the opportunity to move this motion on behalf of my colleagues. This motion has come about following the shocking revelations on a recent BBC Spotlight programme which has exposed an illegal waste dump at Mobile on the outskirts of Derry. The programme makers and an independent report from Professor Chris Mills shed light on the indiscriminate burying of half a million tonnes of illegal waste which has gone undetected for a number of years despite numerous complaints from local residents and stakeholders such as the River Fawn Angling Association. Given the extent of the dumping on this occasion, the cost to the public purse of cleaning up such sites and the environmental impact incidents such as this could have, this programme's findings is a wake-up call to us all. It is now imperative that we grasp this opportunity to examine accurately what has happened that is why we are calling for a public inquiry into waste disposal practices in the North West. That is what is required to restore public confidence. That is what is required to address this problem. And that is what is required to protect our environment properly. Uh, last can call you, there are three elements to this site. A landfill site, a sand and gravel extraction operation, and a material recycling facility. The first element Derry City Council had planning and approval for a landfill site refuge tip dating back to 1980. In 1996, City and Industrial Waste Limited was granted a waste disposal license by Derry City Council for the deposit, transfer or disposal of specified material, presumably on this site, according to uh, Christopher Mills' report. Earliest indications of the second element, extraction of sand and gravel, by Camp C Sand and Gravel Limit, Limited dates back to 1993, and the third element, a materials recycling facility, was created in 2004, adjacent to the quarry and landfill site. At last can call you, a referral from Planning Service in February 2012 to the ECU, which is the Environmental Crime Unit, led to an investigation on discovery of illegal waste. That investigation is still ongoing. Following that, the previous Minister commissioned a review on the 5th of June 2013 by Professor Mills, which was reported on in December of 2013. This report will help form the future direction for waste management, resource efficiencies and enforcement programmes. The terms of reference of that review were what transpired in relation to the waste facility at the Campsie site and to identify any failures that might have occurred in the regulation of this site in respect of any sectors of central government. The external factors leading to the extensive illegal waste dumping at the Campsie site, the lessons this incident provides for the future development 
and administration of waste management, resource efficiency and enforcement programmes. The only gap within that review was whether or not there were any other undetected illegal waste sites, in particular in the North West. The review of this site covers an area of 1.4 kilometres in length and varies in width from 100 metres to 500 metres and is adjacent to the River Fawn. Las Concordia, this is certainly a very complex case involving three sites which are linked. It has actually, in essence, provided the ideal location and conditions for illegal dumping to take place. There is a long history of non-compliance and enforcement actions at this site. The landfill site had been in operation from 1980 and a closure license was issued in August of 2008. From, 20, from 2003 to 2013, NAEA's waste management team issued 37 actions, events or correspondence relating to non-compliant processes or materials and also a notice to close the landfill site. Between 2008 and 2013, Prevention Pollution Control staff, PPC staff, carried out 10 inspections, issued two warning letters and five non-compliance issues, and instruction to City Waste Company to deposit no further material as well. In relation to the materials recycling facility between 2004 and 2013, from the licence was issued to the licence was revoked, 42 inspections were carried out leading to nine warning letters, 17 notices and four license suspensions for a variety of non-compliance issues concerning type, quantity, quantity and storage of waste. Camp C sand and gravel has been operating since 1993, ex extracting sand and gravel, but have carried out extraction without permission for a number of years. The timeline provided from planning when the, when the uh, electronic recording system was in place, which was in 2000, the timeline to date contains over 1,000 entries relating to its regulation of activities on the mobile site or in the adjacent areas. The bulk of these simply track the progress of correspondence or note consultations relating to a total of 27 planning applications received during this period. Planning matters referred to the NEA for comment between 2003 and 2013 included 37 consultations relating to sand and gravel operations, waste or recycling operations and infrastructure. Mr Speaker, given the number of complaints and correspondence, alarm bells should have been ringing, blue lights should have been flashing and actions should have been taken as far back as 2007. A significant opportunity was missed to address this matter in 2007. The first incident was reported to have taken place on the 7th of December 2007 when a member of the ECU stated having made a site visit to Mobile to check out a complaint of noxious smells but it was believed to be reported by Derry City Council. A further site visit was made on the 28th or the 20th of April 2008. Two gas tests were carried out in an area outside the licensed site where subsequently waste was found to have been illegally dumped. The readings were high and in the opinion of the officer concerned, confirmed the presence of landfill gas, which was concluded could only be caused by degrading organic material. The officer brought this matter to the attention of the line manager and recalled suggesting an intrusive survey. However, for reasons unknown to the officer, the investigation was not progressed beyond this initial site investigation. At the beginning of 2009, the officer concerned moved to an R section. However, the validity of this report has been questioned by a senior member of staff in the ECU and no incident report has been located to confirm this. The second incident occurred on the 15th of December 2008 when the LOX agency wrote to the NEA to pass on concern of the River Fawn Anglers Association that there was the possibility of some material outside the disposal category which may be, sh may be shredded and deposed of in this site. So, I mean, Mr. Speaker, there was no response to that letter, as well, that letter as well. The final incident took place in April 2009 when illegal dumping of the material was discovered by the NAA, mainly within the boundary of the licence site, but also slightly extending beyond it. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's a lot of questions that haven't been asked, asked, answered here, and there's a lot of questions to be asked. And I want to commend uh, Professor Mills for his in depth report in this matter. 
Mr. Speaker, while, Mr. Deputy Speaker, whilst I recognise this is a complex issue which spans many different bodies, the Planning Service, the ECU, PPC, the WMU, Environmental Health, Local Council, LRM, and NAEA, and a raft of legislation and regulation, and I'll provide all, all them names for, for, uh, for the recording staff for Hansard. But surely, Mr. Speaker, with all of that legislation and all the groups involved, surely someone somewhere had to take responsibility. So, in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, Sinn Féin are calling this assembly to support this motion and the amendment to establish a public inquiry into what really took place at Mobile. When, when did it start, and how long had it been on for? What, what exactly took place at this site? Where, where did it exactly take place? And is there anywhere else associated or connected to this site? Why, why did it happen and why was it allowed to continue for so long given the number of non-compliance and complaints? And finally, who, who knew what, where, when, who allowed it to happen and who was responsible? So, Shina Will, Lara Agam, Kian Koyla, that's all I have to say. And I support the motion and move the motion on behalf of my party. Go remain the middle of the I call Stephen McNew to move the amendment. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm um, delighted to move this amendment on behalf of Green Party and I, and I thank the proposer for supporting the amendment. The scale of illegal dumping in Northern Ireland is it's unfathomable how, how, how such a level of criminality has, has been allowed to continue for so long. In 2004, the UK Environmental Law Association branded Northern Ireland the dirty corner of the UK and called for us to establish an independent environmental protection agency. Is there something about Northern Ireland that makes us particularly criminal, that makes us particularly bad? I don't think there's something inherent. Yes, we, we certainly have a high level of organized crime, and the Mills report points to, to organized crime as, 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 as being the, the, the cause of this criminality, and I, I, I don't think there's any other way you could describe criminality at this level. But I believe that systematic failures and institu institutional neglect have facilitated waste cr crime in Northern Ireland. A lack of enforcement has left a hole for illegal dumping to fill. Waste crime has not been given the attention it deserves and has not been taken seriously. The department, I feel, has failed um, in its duties to enforce in environmental and planning regulations, and indeed the, the, the judiciary uh, has failed to give sufficient fine and disincentive when charges have been brought and convictions have been brought to those involved in waste crime. The proceeds of waste crime are astronomical. We need fines that, that act as a genuine deterrent and indeed sentences. We need to send out a message that crime doesn't pay by ensuring that the polluter does pay. We have to take this seriously because the financial, social and environmental costs are serious. The Mills report highlights the 516,000 tonnes of illegal waste dumped, or of waste dumped illegally at Moboy points to the 34.6 million minimum in lost tax revenue, and it, it, it's worth pointing out that that's at the Moboy site alone. He identifies a total of 26 uh, illegal sites across Northern Ireland, and that's one of the reasons why, through the amendment, I've sought to, to, to extend this motion beyond just the northwest, where, of course, there is a particular problem, but this, this is a problem that spreads across Northern Ireland. Mills estimates that it will cost the taxpayer 250 million. Sorry, he estimates it costs 250 million to, to, to clean up um, the problem of illegal waste dumping in, in Northern Ireland. Add to this and the lost tax, the cost of investigation, and indeed, um, should it come to it, the cost of possible EU infractions. The question is, can we recoup these costs? Will this happen? I certainly hope and, and that. That the, the department and, and uh, with, along with other agencies will ensure if that's possible that it's done. But, but our record in the past hasn't been good. And if we look at the situation of the Kavanaugh gold mine, the public ultimately paid the price 
for uh, unregulated uh, mining. Prevention, though, is better than cure. So we do need to look at what failures led us to this situation. The fact is that illegal dumping at the scale took place at Moboy could not have occurred had the department stopped unauthorized mineral extraction. One of the best terms I, I read, I came across it in the Mills report, was this idea of the department uh, planning, DOE planning's positive enforcement. The idea was that they wouldn't enforce their own regulations if it was felt that there would be a detrimental impact on the economy. And I can't help but thinking that the 250 million cost, cleanup cost will have a detrimental impact on our economy, particularly if it uh, has to be paid from the public purse, as, as unfortunately it may be the case. And it seems a very political decision for an enforcement agency to be be deciding that it will not enforce um, its own regulations due to economic considerations. I think uh, the, the policy of, of positive enforcement that showed a, a DOE planning have positively failed to enforce um, the regulations that, that, that cover planning. I think as well that the, this political decision making um, reinforces the calls for the need for an independent environmental protection agency. I think the failure to enforce planning has been further highlighted. I, I raised a question with the minister as to how many of the sites at Moboy, which didn't have planning permission, had discharge consents, um, six, six unauthorized landfill sites, or sorry, quarrying sites had discharge consents. And you have to wonder why these operators felt that they could operate without planning permission but couldn't operate without discharge consents. That sounds to me in, like in one case when it comes to discharge, the department is for enforcing regulations, but when it comes to planning, there's been a lex attitude taken. We've had a culture of retrospective regulation of unauthorized sites and planning has been taken very lightly. Um, by, by those in the, uh, in the minerals extraction industry. The EIA directive requires an environmental statement before any quarrying um, can take place. Yet again, unauthorized quarries have been allowed to continue to operate without any sanction from uh, the planning department and without any environmental statement. Why has the department not been enforcing the EIA directive? This is, a, in my view, a systematic failure, um, institutional neglect, which has facilitated illegal dumping in Northern Ireland. As well as the, the financial costs of the illegal dumping that's taken place or social and environmental costs, Again, if we look at the, the, the Moboy case, the uh, western edge of the site, the, the dumping site, uh, stretches for 1.4 kilometres along the River Fawn, um, a special area of, uh, of conservation. The one kilometre downstream of the site is where two-thirds of Derry's drinking water comes from. So it's clear that this is an, it's important that we ensure that we keep these waterways clean, both for the protection of people's health in terms of safe and clean drinking water, but also, as I say, the site is a, uh, borders an area of speci special area of conservation with internationally important populations of Atlantic salmon and river otters. And indeed, the department again has, has shown poor performance and, and reg with regards of protection of special areas of conservation um, with 33 out of 54 designated sites in unfavorable condition. I think it's clear that um, we need a public inquiry across Northern Ireland to look at these issues, not just one site and indeed not just the northwest, although again I acknowledge the, 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 the scale and the importance of looking at the illegal dumping in that area, um, but Mills has identified 26 sites across Northern Ireland 
and this might not be an exhaustive list. We must look not just at the illegal dumping, but the failures of governance which have facilitated the criminality. We must, uh, and a question I would ask for the Minister, this obviously is an issue that will take some time. Will the problems of unauthorised quarrying be passed on with planning to local councils? Because I believe this is a legacy that local councils will not want to inherit. We need a review of mineral per permissions as required by the Habitats regulations, and we need to end the culture of retrospective regulation of planning applications in relation to mineral extraction. Back in when the Northern Ireland Environment Agency was established, Arlene Foster said, I and my party take the issue of environmental governments too seriously to externalise the organisation. I think now, given that we have seen the failures um, of environmental governance in Northern Ireland, I and the Green Party take environmental governance too seriously to leave enforcement in the hands of those whose idea of positive enforcement is to positively ignore enforcement regulations. I think we need an independent environmental planning agency, and I believe that a public inquiry into these issues would draw that conclusion. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Pam Cameron. As a member of the Environment Committee, I support this motion this evening. Mr. Deputy Speaker, illegal waste disposal is not just an unsightly blight on our landscape, but it also carries further costs to society in terms of health and wealth. Evidence suggests that this crime is not happening on an ad hoc basis, but instead is connected with organised crime, and leads me to ask the question, when will the law and order authorities in Northern Ireland get a grip on organised crime and those who profit from it? Would the member give way? Yes. Grateful to the member for giving way. And the member makes a very salient and important point. And following the, the questions that were answered by Drew Harris at the Justice Committee only a couple of weeks ago around this issue, does she agree with me that the, the full extension of the National Crime Agency to Northern Ireland is vital to the points she just made to deal with waste crime, drugs, black market trading, human trafficking and paramilitary activity? And should all parties in this House not be agreeing to the full extension of the, the, the National Crime Agency to Northern Ireland urgently? The member is an extra minute. Uh, I thank my, my colleague for that for that intervention and uh, fully endorse his, his remarks today. Um, I want to continue on, if you don't mind. Um, as we've seen with illegal fuel, not only are the number of arrests pitiful, those who are actually arrested end up with little or no punishment in terms of custodial sentences. So for those perpetrators of organized crime, the message sent out is clear. Profits is great, risks are low, so carry on regardless. Given that organised crime is widespread and convictions are few, it is not surprising that people will continue to seek and exploit a system which appears to be overly complicated and is not working as it was intended. In the Mills report last December, <coughs> it was highlighted that there are various weaknesses within the current system which allow criminals to take advantage of a system to make quick money. Mills noted that the current system of investigation is very weak and not fit for purpose. This would be supported by the facts that locals in the North West had reported concerns about an, Ill an illegal waste site up to six years before the site was properly investigated. And imagine reporting a criminal act and having to wait six years for that act to be investigated. Simply because this crime is of an environmental nature and not against an individual person does not make it any less of a crime. I'm also very concerned that Mill's report concluded that the penalties for this crime are not robust, nor do they reflect the serious nature of the crime. In fact, in reading the report, it appears to me that more often than not, the punishment appears to be little more than a slap on the wrist as opposed to real deterrent. Reducing our waste is a directive from the European Union, and yesterday we noted how the average person in Northern Ireland makes efforts to recycle waste, use the right carrier bag, etc. But on the other hand, organised illegal dumping allowed to go unchallenged, well then, Frankly, it makes a mockery of the efforts of the ordinary individuals. Illegal waste disposal undermines the efforts of society as a whole to act responsibly with our waste. It places people's jobs at risk for those companies and individuals who comply with the letter of the law in their profession, and it places the health of those who live around the illegal dump sites at risk. We need to act now to tighten up on the policies, the procedures, investigations, and prosecutions around these issues. The public need to feel confident 
when they report their concerns that their reports are taken seriously and investigated fully to determine if there are cases to answer. When a person or company is convicted of acting illegally, we must also ensure that the sanction is seen to be appropriate to the crime. Only by doing this can we be seen to be doing the right thing in relation to waste disposal. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the motion. I call Colm Eastwood. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I was absolutely devastated and extremely angry when I saw the extent uh, of this um, illegal activity uh, on the outskirts of our city. Um, it was clear to me and to anybody uh, that looked at it uh, that this was a highly organized, uh, highly developed uh, criminal enterprise uh, that had been allowed to get away um, with uh, vandalizing and devastating our, our local environment uh, for far too long. Uh, and I was glad to see at that point, I think it was on the, 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 the 5th of June, that the then Minister Alex Atwood acted immediately uh, to revoke uh, the license of uh, one particular company uh, on the site. Um, and it was, so, you know, the Spotlight program was very important, but the Spotlight program didn't uh, break this story. This story had been running for quite a while. Um, it was, but it was very disconcerting to find that, and I'm very conscious that there is a criminal investigation ongoing, but it was very disconcerting to find that some people featured in the, the Spotlight program seem more concerned uh, with the state of uh, a green on a golfing course uh, than they did with the, the wildlife or the drinking water uh, in my area. Uh, I found that very uh, disconcerting indeed, and I think it has to be remembered that while uh, it is clear massive mistakes have been made uh, in the lead up uh, to this. Mistakes that should never have happened. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the Minister will and has already said uh, that they were as a result of systematic failings. Um, and he has already proposed and will propose, I'm sure, further uh, changes uh, within his own department to ensure that these type of failings never happen uh, again. Uh, it is true, though, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that these failings weren't only within the NAEA or, or anywhere else. This has been, uh, there's been massive failure right across. Uh, the Justice Department needs to be uh, looking at how they have responded. And I know that the, the, the member has left when he told us um, about the great work that the NCA could do in this field. Unfortunately, SOCA, the organisation that preceded NCA, did absolutely nothing on waste crime in Northern Ireland. Uh, it did nothing to see uh, these kind of activities happening. And, that, and uh, do you want to? I'll give away if you want. Okay. <laughs> Silent once again. Um, but gladly. Um, can, can the member, you know, maybe it's, these benches are confused, or maybe it's the benches opposite. I'm sure he'll be able to tell us. But surely, if the SACA did nothing, and as the member has, has claimed, and I think Mr. McGuinness noted that that was the case, can he tell us, you know, is that a good enough reason not to support the NCA um, if they would have the power to deal with it? Surely we should be working to ensure that the NCA have the power to deal with it, not just say because SACA didn't do it that you're not going to support the NCA. The member's next extra minute, and can I bring the member back to the debate? The I'll, I'll attempt to get back to, to the debate uh, presently, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This party is very proud of our record, ensuring that after a long, long period of misrule in terms of policing in this uh, part of the world, that we made sure that accountability was put into the policing structures in Northern Ireland. We're not going to. We're not going to stand over a situation where accountability is removed from local policing or any other type of policing uh, in this part uh, of the world. And I know the members opposite would be very glad to see that uh, happen, but we're not going to stand for it. Um, but, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, back to the point. Uh, the minister at the time, Alex Atwood, uh, acted very decisively, uh, ensured that the, the company concerned lost their license. Unfortunately, a lot of other people were very silent on that at the time. There was concern about job losses, an understandable concern uh, about job losses, but very little concern about the impact that this would have on our uh, environment uh, and uh, the manner in which some of the employees were treated um, 
uh, not by the department, I have to add, uh, it leaves a lot to be desired, and, and I am very aware that I need to be careful not to stray uh, and to uh, uh, things that would be sub um, the, 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 the Mills report uh, was a robust, independent report into this uh, activity. Uh, and I think the Minister has been very public and open around the Mills report and said that he will act uh, on, on the recommendations within it. I'm sure there will be uh, announcements in the next number of weeks uh, around that. But we have to be serious. If we do want a proper public inquiry, let's have it. Let's have a proper public inquiry into every uh, organisation that should be in charge of waste crime generally uh, in Northern Ireland. Let's do it. Let's see everybody in the dock. Uh, and let's, see, let's talk about fuel laundering. Let's talk about waste crime that's happening right across Northern Ireland that shouldn't be happening. Uh, because it is clear to me and to anybody looking at it, this is highly organised crime that should not be allowed to be continuing and profiting on the backs uh, of the people uh, of, of, of Northern Ireland. And yet the SDLP uh, will not be found wanting when it comes to uh, opening up uh, any department or any organisation to proper and full scrutiny, and I hope everyone else will do the same. I call Tom Elliott. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and um, welcome the opportunity to, to speak in this debate. And I recognise your, your words of caution at the start around the legalities of this particular matter. Uh, and I'm just wondering, obviously, why the, the issue of the spotlight programme was actually mentioned in, in the debate because, or, or in the motion, because it, this matter has been going on long before the, the spotlight uh, programme, because it has been debated. I know in Environment Committee it has been raised in questions here, but anyway, I'm sure that there is a, a reason for that. But this isn't something new. Uh, the, the illegal dumping and widespread illegal dumping throughout Northern Ireland has been going on for years. And coming from Fermanagh and South Tyrone, I know only too well the cost that it is to the environment and the cost that it is to the community, where huge amounts of, of waste material uh, has been illegally dumped. And I know that there was a relationship or an agreement between uh, Northern Ireland Executive here and indeed the Republic of Ireland government to actually repatriate some of that waste and obviously have a, a shared cost. But it does appear to me that for far too long, NIEA and indeed their predecessor of EHS before them have concentrated too much effort on minor discrepancies and picking easy targets to clamp down on. The like of a building contractor who has stored some material that he can use on another site at a later stage, a farmer who has moved a small amount of soil from one field to another, but at the same time, allowing these big-time criminals to make huge amounts of money on the illegal dumping of waste. And I think the resources have been wrongly targeted. Uh, I'm well aware of a number of small businesses that have been closed down due to the heavy-handedness of officialdom, while millionaire criminals go unpunished. And I think that has been a major fault with the process up to now. And I hope that, that the Minister is taking action to resolve that to actually turn the tables on those uh, real big-time criminals and not to concentrate as much on those small, easy pickings of targets. Um, we also witness similar polluting dumps by those who launder fuel, again without any determined action to put these criminals out of business, making millions upon millions on laundered fuel and they, they dump the waste. Who has been caught? Who has been prosecuted? I think there are major questions uh, to be answered. Mr Humphreys uh, earlier referred and mentioned to the benefits that the NCA, National Crime Agency, could achieve. But obviously some parties refuse to agree the work of the NCA here in Northern Ireland. But I hope and I'm sure that like many other issues here in Northern Ireland, these parties will at some stage come to their senses and realise the error of their ways and accept the National Crime Agency's work here in Northern Ireland as it is in the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, the issue obviously has been mentioned within the motion and indeed the amendment about the public inquiry. And I'm content to support that the Minister actually looks at the potential of a public inquiry. But into what? Mr Eastwood has quite rightly referred to how wide that could get, how big that could get. And, and I just feel that if there's going to be a proper public inquiry into the illegal dumping of waste, it needs to be widespread. 
let's not just look at the small issues, and I don't know whether uh, the, the Minister's Environment Department can actually afford it, because uh, it would be a huge task, but I think the starting point isn't the public inquiry, it's actually directing the resources properly into those big-time criminals and making sure that they are caught at source. Because even though, I have to say, when I have been aware that reports have went in of huge amounts of illegal dumping, there has been a reluctance and a delay in acting uh, to, to clamp down on that, whereas when there's those other small amounts of what would be minor discrepancies, uh, the department are very quick to move on those. So I think there's a balance to be got right and the target needs to be in the, in the proper direction. Sorry, give way. I thank the, the member for giving way, and he talks about millionaire criminals that are behind some of these schemes. But uh, th there's some of these schemes in operation in Fermanagh, where it's actually former British Army barracks that have been dumped illegally that aren't being addressed by the Environment Agency. So when the member talks about um, a reluctance for the Environment Agency to deal with these issues, these are issues I've raised with the Environment Agency and can't get them to respond. Is that something that he would share my concerns over? The member has an extra minute. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, welcome to the member's intervention. Uh, I don't think it's the uh, army who actually dumped uh, the material there. My understanding is that that was paid for to contractors to actually take away and dispose of in a proper manner. If they can't do that, that's entirely up to the contractor themselves. Of course, uh, the IRA were very quick to actually make loads of, of waste material in years gone past by trying to bomb the, the base out of Northern Ireland and a lot of those establishments at that time. So I don't think the, the member has anything uh, great to, to crow about in, in that respect, where uh, some people in, in the party that he is now a member of was responsible for destroying Northern Ireland. Thank you. Call Miss Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Waste crime is not new to Northern Ireland, but the illegal dump at Moorboy, highlighted by Spotlight, was on a scale we have never encountered before. The estimated amount of waste to have been illegally deposited is over 500,000 tonnes. Not only is this volume staggering, but its close proximity to the River Falcon was very, very concerning. Although early readings from the river have not shown any significant impact, this will need to be continually assessed to determine the longer-term impact. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the comprehensive Mills report into the illegal dumping at Moboy sets out a list of useful recommendations, which I hope are being implemented by the Department. A disturbing finding shows that reports were made in December 2007 to the NIEA about noxious smells in the area, but no action was taken. As other speakers have said, had this been investigated at the time, this crime could have been stopped six years ago. I understand that the cleanup of the site has begun and the experts have been engaged to determine the best option for dealing with waste. We might have to leave it in situ where it is now. Mrs. Deputy Speaker, we know from an FOI request that NIEA spending on recruitment agencies has more than doubled in two years. Has the impact of replacing a large proportion of permanent staff with temporary workers been assessed? The Muse review states not all regulatory officers possess the right aptitude. We should ascertain if this has been a de detrimental effect on the effectiveness of the agency. If there is to be a public inquiry, then perhaps this should be included in the terms of reference. The Mills review makes the point that some existing powers which were granted to the NIEA by the Waste and Contaminated Land NI Order 1997 appear to have been underused or not used at all. Surely all the powers granted by the order should be used to fight criminality. A recent FOI asked how often the NIEA has used LIPA powers under the regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000 
which allows uh, public bodies to carry out surveillance and investigation. It seems some RIPA powers have not been used in over two years. Has the NIEA abandoned this too to investigate crime? We need to tackle environmental crimes more effectively. We need to deal with the fragmented regulatory system which our government officials work in by taking a more joint up approach both across departments and within departments. Having discussed the scale of criminality in the waste industry with my party colleague, the Justice Minister, his, he is clear that there is a sizable criminal element in the Northern Ireland waste industry and that unfortunately a proportion of those involved do have links to organised crime and paramilitaries. I understand Minister Ford has held discussions with the Environment Minister about how best to tackle this. I think I have to mention it again here. There is a real issue about the inability of the National Crime Agency to operate here in areas that are devolved, including environmental crime. If we are serious about tackling organised criminality, including in the waste industry, we need to utilise all the resources and expertise available. Not having the NCA for political reasons is harming our efforts. Mr Deputy Speaker, I support the call for a public inquiry, but we must not assume that this alone will solve the problem of illegal waste disposal. We need to reflect on the lessons we have learned and what practical measures we must take to ensure further incidents are prevented. I support the motion and the amendment. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think if this House is going to be taken serious about tackling crime, then I think it's going to have to change uh, its forte a bit. I noticed that when uh, Mr Eastwood was challenged about the lack of support his party gives for the creation and the establishment and the working of the NCA here. He got very prickly. Now, he then failed to go on and elaborate in any great detail as to why his party took the stance other than, well, Sokol didn't do, succeed, so they wouldn't succeed, I think, was the inference. Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the motion before us here probably doesn't go far enough. However, uh, in saying that, we as a party will be supporting the motion in the length that it does go. The disposal of waste, the illegal disposal of waste has become a very big issue and I suspect all the revelations to date are but the tip of the iceberg. And whether it's the disposal of the type of waste that uh, prompted this motion or whether it's the waste uh, diesel laundering and uh, the remnants that are left from it or whether it's a plastic bag disposal now, this uh, House took very uh, definite action against the plastic bags, but when it comes to dealing with a crime of this scale, uh, we just don't seem to be up for it. Because, uh, yes, well, yeah. I, I thank the member for giving way, and, and to his list of, of areas we need to tackle, would he uh, agree also we need to look at unauthorised quarrying as another uh, kind of arm of, of, that's facilitated this crime? Well, if I could say to the, to the member, I am a strong supporter of the rule of law. And whether that law runs uh, into South Armagh, where it is now recognised as one of the uh, diesel laundering uh, territories, whether it's in quarrying or whether it's the disposal of waste, waste that has been imported from another country and dumped here, I want to assure him and the House that I fully support all efforts in the drive against that sort of activity. So I want to make that very clear, and I hope that the member accepts and that it is quite clear, and I don't care where this illegal uh, activity is going on, I support. And I don't think we can be half-hearted about this. Unfortunately, within this House, uh, no matter what issue we go to debate, whether it's the issue of illegal dumping, whether it's the, uh, the issue of human trafficking, everybody will stand up and say, yes, I'm opposed to it, and then you wait for the row of butts. And you'll get a 40 or 50 butts as to why they can't go the distance. We've heard the but why we can't support the NCA. And of course, 
The lack of an NCA operating here in Northern Ireland also blunts the drive against this sort of activity. We had up in my own constituency <coughs> in Fermanagh South Tyrone, in particular in the South Tyrone area, where we had waste imported from the Republic of Ireland. Well, the minister did, and I, and, I, and I will be fair, the minister at that time, Mr Atwood, did take the action to ensure that that waste was repatriated back to where it had come from. But the cost that it occurred, I suspect none of us, and that's not his fault, I'm not laying blame at the minister's door for that, uh, but I suspect none of us will ever fully appreciate and understand the full cost of that, not only in terms of pounds and pence, but indeed in terms of hurt to the environment. Now, we can take the environment serious, or we can play about with it and say, well, you know, we are all great environmentalists. But are we, when it comes down to the bit, are we great environmentalists? Do we really? I left this uh, paper here, a very useful uh, paper that is provided in, in the library, and it says, to create a more robust regulatory service and regime, which is des designed to deal with criminality at all levels. Now, is that what we're doing? But I suspect that's not what we're doing. Because I have got a wee bit tired listening to people uh, standing up and asking for criminals to be released from prison, for some of our play parks to be named after criminals, and yet we tell the House today, oh, but we're all opposed to criminality. We are to be sure. We are to be sure. We're not fooling the general public one little bit. And if we're going to take this issue of the disposal of waste, well, then I suspect there's going to be some hurt and pain. And let it be understood, too, that when we hear of these diesel laundering plants, do we ever hear of anybody being arrested? Well, it escapes me if it does. I do not hear of any arrests. wonder why, Mr Deputy Speaker, wonder why nobody is arrested for these diesel laundering plants. Surely to goodness they can't be all run by boogeymen, anonymous individuals who just melt into the environment whenever the, the powers that be uh, catch up with them. They're not there. Why are they not there? Where have they gone to? Well, there's a duty on this House and those of us who call ourselves legislators to be totally, not partially, totally on the side of those who enforce the law in this country. And until we get to that stage, then we're not going to make progress. And whether it's on pleasant and difficult decisions to take on diesel laundering, on the disposal of waste or human trafficking. I don't care what the crime is. And this half-hearted stance that this Assembly has taken to date on a whole lot of these issues is to be deplored. Remember and I will bring you smarts to close. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will. And I implore this House today to start to be a bit more sincere. And then we will get more respect from, our, from those who put us here. Thank you. I'll call Mr Ian Milne. Good last uh, Thank you, Mr our Deputy Speaker, and I rise in support and speak in uh, support of the motion and also of the amendment. My colleague, uh, Mr Boyland, in moving the motion, has outlined the background of this issue in some detail and the rationale for bringing it before the House today. So I want to focus my contribution on the need to move beyond the Spotlight Programme and the review by Mr Christopher Mills and seek to restore public confidence. But equally, I want to acknowledge the contribution that both have made in bringing it to the fore. The review and the media attention on the issue has exposed the scale of the illegal dumping and the catalogue of failures by the NIEA. The lack of joined-up thinking by the various agencies within the department seems hard to believe. It would appear that confusion reigns or reigned in terms of responsibility, and in the aftermath of the Mills report, there is a dire need for a robust change within NIEA. Now is the time, I believe, for the Minister to give consideration to, establish, to the establishment of an independent environment protection agency. Over the last number of years, we have had many excellent initiatives aimed at encouraging recycling and the reduction of waste. Recycling centres and the blue household bins have been a huge success, and great efforts have been made at local council level to work towards and meet EU targets on landfill. Discoveries like the site on the Moyboy Road flies in the face of this positive work, and it leaves questionable whether the targets have actually been achieved or are we now further behind than ever before. 
The Mills Review in itself is a very clear, is a very detailed and informative piece of work, but it raises but it, its findings raise many unque unanswered questions. For instance, why, despite all the warning signs, numerous complaints and a long history of non compliance, did the site remain operational for so long? Why were the companies who were able to tender so low not scrutinised more? What are the consequences now of, dis of disturbing this waste material? Could the process of moving it actually be more environmental damaging? What ultimately, or ultimately will be the cost to the public purse, and where will the money come from? And crucially, if, as suggested in both the Mills report and that of Professor Sharon Turner and Kira Brennan, that the current conditions within the waste industry are wide open for exploitation by organised criminals, then there is every reason to be concerned that this problem extends far beyond the Campsie site. Given the analyses uh, within the Department's approach to date, how can the public have any confidence that Operations Sycamore will be any more effective than NIEA? We need to tackle the issue uh, of illegal dumping on both small and large scale. If the NIEA can't or won't deal with fly tipping on rural roads, then what faith can people have that they will deal effectively with large scale operations such as the one being discussed today? What we need now is, open, is openness and transparency. We need to allow people and groups the opportunity to come forward and have an input. And the best way to do this is through an independent inquiry. And I support the motion. Call Mr. Ian McCrae. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I suppose, as my colleagues have said, uh, we will be supporting the, the motion. Um, mind you, as Lord Morrow said, um, it probably doesn't go far enough, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we will be, be supporting it. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I agree with Tom Elliott um, when he said that, you know, as all members will know, this has been going on for many, many years. It's not a new um, thing that has just happened because Spotlight have, have got a hold of, of um, some information and decided to do a programme on it. It's been going on across Northern Ireland for many years um, in my own constituency and indeed I know of other constituencies who um, have been blighted by this issue. But I think it's important that, um, you know, whilst we do um, accept that this is a problem within our society, I think one of the issues that I don't think has been given enough focus on is, is the issue around how we um, deal with the clean-up of all of this. And I think that um, certainly most members around this um, council or around here ha have been on councils at some part of their, their career and will know that any of these issues that come before councils are very delicate and very difficult to overcome. And I think it's under the, the waste and contaminated land order that councils have the option to clean up a site but they have no legal sanction to allow them to um, go after the, the person responsible or indeed the landowner, as it, as it seems, as, if, if they are not aware who carried that out. And the difficulty in that is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the cost that that brings to, to ratepayers. And I think that that sometimes is lost on, on um, this when, when it is debated. And on the other side of it, in this, within the same order, the department have the power to take the legal action, to clean it up, and then take the, or pass the costs on to those responsible. So I think it's important that we, we can consider that up that, uh, as, as we're debating this. The Minister will be aware, um, I don't think it, was under his, it wasn't under his tenure, but that about 12 months ago, or just over a year ago, the flight tipping pilot was introduced with local government and the department. And as far as I'm aware, about half of the councils came on board, um, and which allowed councils to deal with the minor fly tipping issues and the department to deal with the more sinister type, as members have referred to, like um, the tipping of waste and indeed fuel laundering. And I think if, if the minister can, if he has any information around that, I think it, if he could um, give us more information, because I believe there's a review due at the end of, of this month. 
Uh, in respect of, of that, when he, the Minister is carrying out the review, and the outcome of that should be that the Department fully resources um, any future process, because if it does not, the, the, the other 50 per cent of the councils that were involved with this will certainly be looking at whether or not this um, is going to have the, the proper resources, and unfortunately, if not, I feel that it is going to go backwards rather than forwards. It is important that, as we deal with this issue of illegal dumping, that as colleagues and a number of colleagues around the, the chamber have referred to the uh, NCA, I do not think it is enough for um, us as an, as an assembly or indeed pick sides of the House to support this or not. I think it is too important of an issue that we get to grips with the whole issue of um, the assets of these people that are responsible for this. And therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support the motion. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And um, uh, could I say that, uh, like others, I was uh, very shocked uh, by the revelations in the Spotlight Program. Uh, of course, uh, the Spotlight Program merely highlighted what we had known before, but. Nonetheless, the visual impact of it was uh, quite devastating and shocking to everybody that viewed it. Uh, and it, it highlighted the degree of um, skill and resources that criminals put into a criminal enterprise, uh, such as uh, illegal uh, dumping of waste. And it illustrates, I think, the uh, huge amount of um, profit that there is in such criminal activity. And of course, this is an unintended consequence of uh, the measures that we have taken in this society and throughout Europe to deal with the whole problem of waste uh, throughout, uh, in particular throughout Europe. Um, the key policy driver has been to reduce waste in Northern Ireland and across Europe. And that's achieved through the landfill tax However, the use of lowest cost tenders makes it easy uh, for criminals uh, posing as legitimate waste contractors to undercut legitimate businesses. And that, this is one of the ill effects of uh, uh, the, the, these criminal enterprises, to undermine honest, hardworking people who are involved in the legitimate side of, of this business. And, yes, I will. Yes. The member makes a very important point, but will the member not also accept that, as other members have referred to, the fact that the prosecutions or lack of prosecutions that have been taking place doesn't really put that fear into those people who are the intelligent criminals and, and those who you know, really know what they're doing and allows them to actually undercut people because they don't have any fear of, of prosecution. I, I think the member has either been reading my script or scanning my brain uh, because, <laughs> because that's exactly what I was going to say. And I agree with uh, Mrs. Cameron in her comments, which were particularly forceful in terms of dealing with the criminals. First of all, the detection rates are uh, too low. And secondly, uh, after the laborious efforts of the Environmental Agency and all the rest, the police and so forth, uh, whenever these people are, are brought to court, the penalties imposed are uh, grossly inadequate. Um, and the penalties really have to be uh, severe. Uh, the monetary penalties, I'm not concerned about imprisonment, because I don't think imprisonment really works in relation to this. The greed is such uh, that they would prefer to go to prison, stash their money away, and, uh, uh, and, and reap the benefit of that when they come out of prison. The important thing is for the courts uh, to realise the damage that this has been, that's being caused to the environment and the extent of the profit uh, that has been made by these criminal gangs. Uh, and, you know, there is a paramilitary a paramilitary element in all of this, of this I am quite certain. Uh, and so we, not, not only are we have, do we have criminal gangs, but we, criminal gangs 
uh, with a paramilitary dimension as well. Uh, and who knows where that money is going uh, uh, in terms of, of paramilitary activity. So we have a very, very uh, dangerous situation here and, and, and one which needs to be tackled. I, I have to commend the previous minister whenever uh, this situation was exposed. He acted quickly, he revoked the license and uh, he uh, set about trying to address the issue. But of course, of course, uh, half a million tons uh, had, had been um, disposed of illegally, and that's a massive, just a massive amount uh, of waste. And we, as ordinary citizens, have to pay the price for that in terms of uh, cleaning uh, this up. Uh, and, and, and this is just an extraordinary situation. But uh, we must learn the lessons. Now, as Mr. Eastwood has said, uh, if there is to be an inquiry, let's make this inquiry a thorough and widespread inquiry that covers all the areas uh, that have been mentioned throughout the course of this debate, that we get to the very roots of this problem, that we tackle the criminality, and that we, we uh, use our best efforts in our society in order to bring uh, those criminals to book. And I think that we can collectively do that, and I think that there's enough goodwill and enough collective effort here uh, to be supportive of the minister, supportive of the department, supportive of the executive, to have a co coordinated uh, and comprehensive attack uh, on uh, this type of crime that does, does so much damage to our society and to our environment. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Call the Minister of the Environment, Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Durkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, for this opportunity to respond to the motion and to the amendment. I can fully understand the concerns that have been voiced here today about waste crime. It's a serious and widespread problem here in the North and elsewhere. The real and potential damage to the environment from the type of waste dumping on covered at Camp C is enormous, and the financial loss to government, to legitimate business, and to taxpayers is immense, as these monies go to line the pockets of criminals who have nothing to offer and are fully intent on furthering their own self-interests. What I couldn't understand before today is why the members were proposing that there should be a further inquiry into the problem, because, as they are well aware, a full and independent review has already been conducted. At a later stage, a farmer who has moved a small amount of soil from one field to another, but at the same time allowing these big-time criminals to make huge amounts of money on the illegal dumping of waste. And I think the resources have been wrongly targeted. Uh, I'm well aware of a number of small businesses that have been closed down due to the heavy-handedness of officialdom, while millionaire criminals go unpunished. And I think that has been a major fault with the process up to now, and I hope that, that the Minister is taking action to resolve that, to actually turn the tables on those uh, real big-time criminals, and not to concentrate as much on those small, easy pickings of targets. Um, we also witness similar polluting dumps by those who launder fuel, again without any determined action to put these criminals out of business making millions upon millions on laundered fuel and they, they dumped the waste. Who has been caught? Who has been prosecuted? I think there are major questions uh, to be answered. Mr Humphreys uh, earlier referred and mentioned to the benefits that the NCA, National Crime Agency, could achieve. But obviously some parties refuse to agree the work of the NCA here in Northern Ireland. But I hope and I'm sure that like many other issues here in Northern Ireland, these parties will at some stage come to their senses and realise the error of their ways and accept the National Crime Agency's work here in Northern Ireland as it is in the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, the issue obviously has been mentioned within the motion and indeed the amendment about the public inquiry. And I'm content to support that the Minister actually looks at the potential of a public inquiry. But into what? Mr Eastwood has quite rightly referred to how wide that could get, how big that could get. 
and, and I just feel that if there's going to be a proper public inquiry into the illegal dumping of waste, it needs to be widespread. Let's not just look at the small issues, and, and I don't know whether uh, the, the Minister's Environment Department can actually afford it, because uh, it would be a huge task. But I think the starting point isn't the public inquiry. It's actually directing the resources properly into those big-time criminals and making sure that they are caught at source. Because even though, I have to say, when I have been aware that reports have went in of huge amounts of illegal dumping, there has been a reluctance and a delay in acting uh, to, to clamp down on that, whereas when there's those other small amounts of what would be minor discrepancies, uh, the department are very quick to move on those. So I think there's a balance to be got right and the target needs to be in the, in the proper direction. Sorry, give way. I thank the, the member for giving way, and he talks about millionaire criminals that are behind some of these schemes. But uh, the, there's some of these schemes in operation in Fermanagh where it's actually former British Army barracks that have been dumped illegally that aren't being addressed by the Environment Agency. So when the member talks about um, a reluctance for the Environment Agency to deal with these issues, these are issues I've raised with the Environment Agency and can't get them to respond. Is that something that he would share my concerns over? The member has an extra minute. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, welcome to the member's intervention. Uh, I don't think it's the uh, army who actually dumped uh, the material there. My understanding is that that was paid for to contractors to actually take away and dispose of in a proper manner. If they can't do that, that's entirely up to the contractor themselves. Of course, uh, the IRA were very quick to actually make loads of, of waste material in years gone past by trying to bomb the, the base out of Northern Ireland and a lot of those establishments at that time. So I don't think the, the member has anything uh, great to, to crow about in, in that respect, where uh, some people in, in the party that he is now a member of was responsible for destroying Northern Ireland. Thank you. Call Miss Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Waste crime is not new to Northern Ireland, but the illegal dump at Moorboy, highlighted by Spotlight, was on a scale we have never encountered before. The estimated amount of waste to have been illegally deposited is over 500,000 tonnes. Not only is this volume staggering, but its close proximity to the River Falcon was very, very concerning. Although early readings from the river have not shown any significant impact, this will need to be continually assessed to determine the longer-term impact. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the comprehensive Mills report into the illegal dumping at Moboy sets out a list of useful recommendations, which I hope are being implemented by the Department. A disturbing finding shows that reports were made in December 2007 to the NIEA about noxious smells in the area, but no action was taken. As other speakers have said, had this been investigated at the time, this crime could have been stopped six years ago. I understand that the cleanup of the site has begun and experts have been engaged to determine the best option for dealing with waste. We might have to leave it in situ where it is now. Mrs. Deputy Speaker, we know from an FOI request that NIEA spending on recruitment agencies has more than doubled in two years. Has the impact of replacing a large proportion of permanent staff with temporary workers been assessed? The Mills review states not all regulatory officers possess the right aptitude. We should ascertain if this has been a de detrimental effect on the effectiveness of the agency. If there is to be a public inquiry, then perhaps this should be included in the terms of reference. The Mills review makes the point that some existing powers which were granted to the NIEA by the Waste and Contaminated Land NI Order 1997 appear to have been underused or not used at all. Surely all the powers granted by the order should be used to fight criminality. A recent FOI asked 
how often the NIEA has used allied PA powers under the regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, which allows uh, public bodies to carry out surveillance and investigation. It seems some RIPA powers have not been used in over two years. Has the NIEA abandoned this too to investigate crime? We need to tackle environmental crimes more effectively. We need to deal with the fragmented regulatory system which our government officials work in by taking a more joint up approach both across departments and within departments. Having discussed the scale of criminality in the waste industry with my party colleague, the Justice Minister, his, he is clear that there is a sizable criminal element in the Northern Ireland waste industry, and that unfortunately, a proportion of those involved do have links to organized crime and paramilitaries. I understand Minister Ford has held discussions with the Environment Minister about how best to tackle this. I think I have to mention it again here, there is a real issue about the inability of the National Crime Agency to operate here in areas that are devolved, including environmental crime. If we are serious about tackling organized criminality, including in the waste industry, we need to utilize all the resources and expertise available. Not having the NCA for political reasons is harming our efforts. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support the call for a public inquiry, but we must not assume that this alone will solve the problem of illegal waste disposal. We need to reflect on the lessons we have learned and what practical measures we must take to ensure further incidents are prevented. I support the motion and the amendment. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think if this House is going to be taken serious about tackling crime, then I think it's going to have to change uh, its forte a bit. I noticed that when uh, Mr. Eastwood was challenged about the lack of support his party gives for the creation and the establishment and the working of the NCA here, he got very prickly. Now, he then failed to go on and elaborate in any great detail as to why his party took the stance, other than, well, Sokov didn't do, succeed, so they wouldn't succeed, I think, was the inference. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the, the motion before us here probably doesn't go far enough. However, uh, in saying that, we as a party will be supporting the motion in the length that it does go. The disposal of waste, the illegal disposal of waste, has become a very big issue. And I suspect all the revelations to date are but the tip of the iceberg. And whether it's the disposal of the type of waste that uh, prompted this motion, or whether it's the waste uh, diesel laundering and uh, the remnants that are left from it, or whether it's a plastic bag disposal. Now, this uh, House took very uh, definite action against the plastic bags. But when it comes to dealing with a crime of this scale, uh, we just don't seem to be up for it. Because, uh, yes, well, yeah. I, I thank the member for giving way, and, and to his list of, of areas we need to tackle, would he uh, agree also we need to look at unauthorised quarrying as another uh, kind of arm of, of, that's facilitated this crime? Well, if I could say to the, to the member, I am a strong supporter of the rule of law. And whether that law runs uh, into South Armagh, where it is now recognized as one of the uh, diesel laundering uh, territories, whether it's in Quarian, or whether it's the disposal of waste, waste that has been imported from another country and dumped here, I want to assure him and the House that I fully support all efforts in the drive against that sort of activity. So I want to make that very clear, and I hope that the member accepts and that is quite clear, and I don't care where this illegal uh, activity is going on, I support. And I don't think we can be half-hearted about this. Unfortunately, within this House, uh, no matter what issue we go to debate, whether it's the issue of illegal dumping, whether it's the, uh, the issue of human trafficking, everybody will stand up and say, yes, I'm opposed to it, and then you wait for the row of butts. 
and you'll get 40 or 50 buts as to why they can't go the distance. We have heard the but why we can't support the NCA. And of course, the lack of an NCA operating here in Northern Ireland also blunts the drive against this sort of activity. We had up in my own constituency, <coughs> in Fermanagh South Tyrone, in particular in the South Tyrone area, where we had waste imported from the Republic of Ireland. Well, the minister did, and I, and, I, and I will be fair, the minister at that time, Mr Atwood, did take the action to ensure that that waste was repatriated back to where it had come from. But the cost that it incurred, I suspect none of us, and that's not his fault, I'm not laying blame at the minister's door for that, uh, but I suspect none of us will ever fully appreciate and understand the full cost of that, not only in terms of pounds and pence, but indeed in terms of hurt to the environment. Now, we can take the environment serious, or we can play about with it and say, well, you know, we are all great environmentalists. But are we, when it comes to, down to the bit, are we great environmentalists? Do we really? I left this uh, paper here, a very useful uh, paper that is provided in, in the library, and it says, to create a more robust regulatory service and regime, which is des designed to deal with criminality at all levels. Now, is that what we're doing? But I suspect that's not what we're doing. Because I have got a wee bit tired listening to people uh, standing up and asking for criminals to be released from prison, for some of our play parks to be named after criminals, and yet we tell the House today, oh, but we're all opposed to criminality. We are to be sure. We are to be sure. We're not fooling the general public one little bit. And if we're going to take this issue of the disposal of waste well, then I suspect there's going to be some hurt and pain. And let it be understood, too, that when we hear of these diesel laundering plants, do we ever hear of anybody being arrested? Well, it escapes me if it does. I do not hear of any arrests. Wonder why, Mr. Deputy Speaker, wonder why nobody is arrested for these diesel laundering plants. Surely to goodness they can't be all run by boogeymen anonymous individuals who just melt into the environment whenever the, the powers that be uh, catch up with them. They're not there. Why are they not there? Where have they gone to? Well, there's a duty on this House and those of us who call ourselves legislators to be totally, not partially, totally on the side of those who enforce the law in this country. And until we get to that stage, then we're not going to make progress. And whether it's on pleasant and difficult decisions to take on diesel laundering, on the disposal of waste, or human trafficking, I don't care what the crime is. And this half-hearted stance that this Assembly has taken to date on a whole lot of these issues is to be deplored. The member and I will bring his remarks to a close. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will, and I implore this House today to start to be a bit more sincere and then we will get more respect from, our, from those who put us here. Thank you. I'll call Mr Ian Milne. Good last uh, Thank you, Mr. Our Deputy Speaker. And I rise in support and speak in uh, support of the motion and also of the amendment. My colleague, uh, Mr. Boyland, in moving the motion, has outlined the background of this issue in some detail and the rationale for bringing it before the House today. So I want to focus my contribution on the need to move beyond the Spotlight Programme and the review by Mr Christopher Mills and seek to restore public confidence. But equally, I want to acknowledge the contribution that both have made in bringing it to the fore. Their review and the media attention on the issue has exposed the scale of the illegal dumping and the catalogue of failures by the NIEA. The lack of joined up thinking by the various agencies within the department seems hard to believe. It would appear that confusion reigns or reigned in terms of responsibility, and in the aftermath of the Mills report, there is a dire need for a robust change within NIEA. Now is the time, I believe, for the Minister to give consideration to, establish, to the establishment of an independent environment protection agency. Over the last number of years, we have had many excellent initiatives aimed at encouraging recycling and the reduction of waste. Recycling centres and the blue household bins have been a huge success and great efforts have been made at local council level to work towards and meet EU targets on landfill. Discoveries like the site on the Moyboy Road flies in the face of this positive work, and it leaves 
questionable whether the targets have actually been achieved or are we now further behind than ever before. The Mills Review in itself is a very clear, is very detailed and informative piece of work, but, it raises, but it, its findings raise many unque unanswered questions. For instance, why, despite all the warning signs, numerous complaints and a long history of non-compliance, did the site remain operational for so long? Why were the companies who were able to tender so low not scrutinised more? What are the consequences now of, dis of disturbing this waste material? Could the process of moving it actually be more environmental damaging? What ultimately, or ultimately will be the cost to the public purse and where will the money come from? And crucially, if, as suggested in both the Mills report and that of Professor Sharon Turner and Kira Brennan, that the current conditions within the waste industry are wide open for exploitation by organised criminals, then there is every reason to be concerned that this problem extends far beyond the Campsie site. Given the inadequacies uh, within the Department's approach to date, how can the public have any confidence that Operations Sycamore will be any more effective than NIEA? We need to tackle the issue uh, of illegal dumping on both small and large scale. If the NIEA can't or won't deal with fly tipping on rural roads, then what faith can people have that they will deal effectively with large scale operations such as the one being discussed today? What we need now is, open, is openness and transparency. We need to allow people and groups the opportunity to come forward and have an input. And the best way to do this is through an independent inquiry. And I support the motion. Call Mr. Ian McCrae. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I suppose, as my colleagues have said, uh, we will be supporting the, the motion. Um, mind you, as Lord Morrow said, um, it probably doesn't go far enough, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we will be, be supporting it. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I agree with Tom Elliott um, when he said that, you know, as all members will know, this has been going on for many, many years. It's not a new um, thing that has just happened because Spotlight have, have got a hold of, of um, some information and decided to do a programme on it. It's been going on across Northern Ireland for many years. Um, in my own constituency, and indeed I know of other constituencies who um, have been blighted by this issue. But I think it's important that, um, you know, whilst we do um, accept that this is a problem within our society, I think one of the issues that I don't think has been given enough focus on is, is the issue around how we um, deal with the clean-up of all of this. And, I think that um, certainly most members around this um, council are around here ha have been on councils at some part of their, their career and will know that any of these issues that come before councils are very delicate and very difficult to overcome. And I think it's under the, the waste and contaminated land order that councils have the option to clean up a site, but they've no legal sanction to allow them to um, go after the, the person responsible, or indeed the landowner, as it, as it seems, as if, if they're not aware who carried that out. And the difficulty in that is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the cost that that brings to, to ratepayers. And I think that that sometimes is lost on, on um, this when, when it's debated. And on the other side of it, in this, within the same order, the department have the power to take the legal action to clean it up and then take the, or pass the costs on to those responsible. So I think it's important that we, we con consider that up that, uh, as, as we're debating this. The Minister will be aware, um, I don't think it, was under his, it wasn't under his tenure, but that about 12 months ago or just over a year ago, the fly tipping pilot was introduced with local government and the department. And as far as I'm aware, about half of the councils came on board um, and which allowed councils to deal with the minor fly tipping issues and the department to deal with the more sinister type, as members have referred to, like um, the tipping of waste and indeed fuel laundering. 
And I think if, if the minister can, if he has any information around that, I think it, if he could um, give us more information, because I believe there's a review due at the end of, of this month. Um, in respect of, of that, when he, the minister is carrying out the review, and the outcome of that should be that the department fully resources um, any future process, because if it doesn't, the, the, the other 50 per cent of the councils that were involved with this will certainly be looking at whether or not this um, is going to have the, the proper resources, and unfortunately, if not, I feel that it's going to go backwards rather than forwards. It is important that, as we deal with this issue of illegal dumping, that as colleagues and a number of colleagues around the, the chamber have referred to the uh, NCA, I don't think it's enough for um, us as an, as an assembly, or indeed pick sides of the House to support this or not. I think it's too important of an issue that we get to grips with the whole issue of um, the assets of these people that are responsible for this. And therefore, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I support the motion. Call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And um, uh, could I say that, uh, like others, I was uh, very shocked uh, by the revelations in the Spotlight Programme. Uh, of course, uh, the Spotlight Programme merely highlighted what we had known before, but nonetheless, the visual impact of it was uh, quite devastating and shocking to everybody that viewed it. Uh, and it, it highlighted the degree of um, skill and resources that criminals put into a criminal enterprise, uh, such as uh, illegal uh, dumping of waste. And it illustrates, I think, the a uh, huge amount of um, profit that there is in such criminal activity. And of course, this is an unintended consequence of uh, the measures that we have taken in this society and throughout Europe to deal with the whole problem of waste uh, throughout, uh, in particular, throughout Europe. Um, the key policy driver has been to reduce waste in Northern Ireland and across Europe and that's achieved through the landfill tax. However, the use of lowest cost tenders makes it easy uh, for criminals uh, posing as legitimate waste contractors to undercut legitimate businesses. And that, this is one of the ill effects of uh, uh, the, the, these criminal enterprises, to undermine honest, hardworking people who are involved in the legitimate side of, of this business. And, yes, I will. Yes. The member makes a, a very important point, but will the member not also accept that, as other members have referred to, the fact that the prosecutions or lack of prosecutions that have been taking place doesn't really put that fear into those people who are the intelligent criminals and, and those who you know, really know what they're doing and allows them to actually undercut people because they don't have any fear of, of prosecution. I, I think the member has either been reading my script or scanning my brain uh, because, <laughs> because that's exactly what I was going to say. And I agree with uh, Mrs. Cameron in her comments, which were particularly forceful in terms of dealing with the criminals. First of all, the detection rates are uh, too low. And secondly, uh, after the laborious efforts of the environmental agency and all the rest, the police and so forth, uh, whenever these people are, are brought to court, the penalties imposed are uh, grossly inadequate. Um, and the penalties really have to be uh, severe. Uh, the monetary penalties, I'm not concerned about imprisonment, because I don't think imprisonment really works in relation to this. The greed is such uh, that they would prefer to go to prison, start their money away, and, uh, uh, and, and reap the benefit of that when they come out of prison. The important thing is for the courts uh, to realize the damage that this has been, that's being caused to the environment and the extent of the profit uh, that has been made by these criminal gangs. Uh, and, you know, there is a paramilitary 
a paramilitary element in all of this, of this I'm quite certain. Uh, and so we, not, not only are we have, do we have criminal gangs, but we have criminal gangs uh, with a paramilitary dimension as well. Uh, and who knows where that money is going uh, uh, in terms of, of paramilitary activity. So we have a very, very uh, dangerous situation here and, and, and one which needs to be tackled. I, I have to commend the previous minister whenever uh, this situation was exposed. He acted quickly, he revoked the license and uh, he uh, set about trying to address the issue. But of course, of course, uh, half a million tons uh, had, had been um, disposed of illegally and that's a massive, just a massive amount uh, of waste and we as ordinary citizens have to pay the price for that in terms of uh, cleaning uh, this up uh, and, and, and this is just an extraordinary situation but uh, we must learn the lessons now as Mr Eastwood has said uh, if there is to be an inquiry let's make this inquiry a thorough and widespread inquiry that covers all the areas uh, that have been mentioned throughout the course of this debate, that we get to the very roots of this problem, that we tackle the criminality, and that we, we uh, use our best efforts in our society in order to bring uh, those criminals to book. And I think that we can collectively do that, and I think there's enough goodwill and enough collective effort here uh, to be supportive of the minister, supportive of the department, supportive of the executive, to have a co coordinated uh, and comprehensive attack uh, on uh, this type of crime that does, does so much damage to our society and to our environment. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Call the Minister of the Environment, Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Durkin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, for this opportunity to respond to the motion and to the amendment. I can fully understand the concerns that have been voiced here today about waste crime. It's a serious and widespread problem here in the North and elsewhere. The real and potential damage to the environment from the type of waste dumping on covered at Campsie is enormous. And the financial loss to government, to legitimate business and to taxpayers is immense, as these monies go to line the pockets of criminals who have nothing they offer and are fully intent on furthering their own self-interests. What I couldn't understand before today is why the members were proposing that there should be a further inquiry into the problem, because as they are well aware, a full and independent review has already been conducted and a full criminal investigation is already underway. When my predecessor received the results last June, of an unprecedented investigation into allegations of large-scale criminal offending involving the disposal of waste, he took decisive action. Action that I must say, and Mr Eastwood said, was criticised by some in this House, in fact, by those proposing the motion today. In fact, up until the airing of Spotlight, Sinn Féin's interest in this issue was minimal, or maybe they had more of an interest than they let on. One of the first things Mr Atwood did was to instigate an immediate independent review. He appointed the former chief executive of the Welsh Environment Agency, Chris Mills, to undertake the review, someone with the experience and credentials to be able to critically review the circumstances of the problem and recommend how to deal with it. Mr Mills has carried out his review and he presented his report to me in December. Members have already seen it, or at least have access to it because I released it only a few days after receiving it to allow public debate on its important findings. The findings are comprehensive and the recommendations are comprehensive to ensure improvements in tackling waste criminality and waste dumping. In my view, it will, as the motion states, ensure that public confidence is restored. A further study as called for in the motion we have before us today is not essential and could simply be a distraction and a waste of public money. As members will know, to set up a statutory inquiry 
if that is what the proposers are calling for, will undoubtedly require substantial resources, both in terms of money to pay for the panel, legal costs, expenses of witnesses and the like, and in staff resources needed to service the inquiry. It will also take time to conduct the inquiry, and experience shows us that these inquiries take considerable time to complete. We do not have that luxury. So the key question is, what will another inquiry produce beyond what has already been produced by the Mills report and will be produced through the live criminal investigation? I venture that it will not add much of significance. What is needed is to devote our resources to taking immediate action and implementing the Mills report findings and not diverting them into producing a review of a review and to assisting in the criminal investigation in any way we can. As I said during question time last week, when I got the Mills report, I directed my officials to prepare plans to implement the report's recommendations, and I will outline these plans when I issue my response to the report later this month. However, as I have said, time is of the essence, and while the report findings are being assessed, I have committed to a major sustained effort to tackle the serious widespread problems in Northern Ireland waste management and fix them. A key theme in the report is that the various government bodies involved, the Department, NIEA and the local councils, need to strengthen the way they work together. This needs to be in everything, from stopping waste being created in the first place, properly regulating and managing the waste that is created and driving criminality out of our waste sector. That is why I am working closely with Terry Ahern, Chief Executive of NIEA, to drive major change in the way the agency works. The agency is now working much more closely with local councils to ensure a strong combination in the way councils manage their waste and the way NIEA regulates and enforces waste work. This will help all waste operators understand that central and local government are working together and expecting major improved performance and full compliance. I am also looking to ramp up partnerships with business to stop waste being created in the first place by treating their so-called waste as the valuable resource that it is, and that will help their bottom line. This will reduce the supply of waste for criminals. I am developing a better regulation bill so that good, compliant businesses are freed of pointless red tape and regulatory resources can be redirected to those who do not comply. And that is an issue that Mr Elliott had, had touched on. A review of key legislative powers, such as who is a fit person to hold a waste licence, is also underway. I have also increased the number of enforcement experts in the NIEA Environmental Crime Unit and increased the number of waste crime investigations. Also, in relation to Mr Agnew's amendment, the DOE planning enforcement policy allows for unauthorised development to be remedied in a number of ways, including by way of a retrospective planning application. These applications include mitigation, assessment and conditions which allow development to be carried out in an acceptable manner. Where development is oh, I can't really have time, Stephen, sorry. Where development is considered unacceptable, then formal enforcement action will commence. I would also emphasise there are a number of enforcement cases and applications relating to Maboy Road which the Department is taking forward with the Environmental Crime Unit and the NIEA. I am not going to stand here today and try to defend the indefensible. Huge mistakes have been made and they have been referred to today. It is important that we have learnt from those mistakes and ensure that they never happen again. Huge gaps have appeared and it is important that we do not allow those to exist to be exploited again. <coughs> I recently announced that minerals and planning are one of my top priorities, and to this end, I have allocated more resources 
to the team in planning headquarters dealing with minerals. And believe me, they have plenty to do. And I am determined, in response to your earlier question, Mr Agnew, that it is done before the transfer of planning to councils. Work has commenced between planning and the Environmental Crime Unit, looking at unauthorised quarries, identifying common concerns, sharing information and better targeting resources. I will just uh, respond to some of the points uh, other members had, had raised. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Boylan uh, stated that the only gap in the review in reference to the, the, the Mills report was whether or not there were any other illegal dumping sites in the area. If that is the only gap, then I have to wonder why Mr. Boylan is calling for this further uh, report, other than maybe in the vain hope that, that I might refuse it. He said alarm bells, as, as Mr Boylan put it, should have been ringing, and the failings to respond to those alarm bells highlight systemic failure, certainly. Why did it happen, he asked. And my answer, it happened because gaps exist, and where gaps exist in legislation and regulation and enforcement, there will always be those who are willing, ready and able to exploit those gaps for their own gain, and it is up to us to close those gaps. Organised criminal gangs have run rings round the responsible authorities, and we will never make it as easy for them to do so again. In the, the green corner, and the, describing us as the dirty corner, Mr Agnew has always raised some very pertinent points. Waste crime of this extent could not have occurred had action been taken on unauthorised extraction. I agree. And those working in, in planning at that time must ask themselves why none was. And we must ask them too. Uh, the cost of the clean-up, Mr Agnew referred to as possibly £250 million. Pounds. That's the highest I've heard yet. I don't think this problem needs exaggerated. It's big enough. But I, like him, would certainly like to see the polluter pay. Mrs Cameron uh, spoke in disbelief that no action was taken over six years uh, from irregularities at this site being reported until they were investigated. Hopefully that's recognition that any positive action that has been taken has been taken by an SDLP Environment Minister. Mr Eastwood referred to employees who have been treated with the same disdain as the environment. And just this week, I was contacted by a contractor who is owed still thousands of, of pounds by this company. Mr Elliott referred to the fact that this was an issue before Spotlight. That is true, and he, like Mr Eastwood, referred to fuel laundering. I have met with the Justice Minister on this issue, as well as the need for more stringent sentences to act as a better deterrent against this type of crime. He questioned who would pick up the bill for the, uh, the further inquiry, and that is something I will need to get extra resources from the executive for, and I look forward to all party support in my attempts to do so. We can't afford to throw more money into a hole in the ground, if you pardon the expression. Ms Lowe spoke of possible paramilitary involvement. Lord Morrow referred to the positive and firm action that this House has taken against plastic bags. I'm sorry he's left. I, I would have loved to remind him that it's all carrier bags, not just plastic <laughs> bags. <laughs> okay. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we need to be realistic here. Widespread trans sector problems cannot be fixed overnight. The BBC Spotlight programme simply confirms this. The bottom line is that I am tackling these problems head on with actions that address problems right throughout the system. I am not taking the easy way out by putting in place a few piecemeal actions and pretending that this will sort the problems. I am doing what I can now to overhaul the system and will be using the findings and recommendations in the Mills report to guide me in what more I can do to make the waste sector a legitimate an economically strong sector. Setting up another inquiry could, in my view, delay any real action. 
However, my approach and that of my predecessor to this issue is one which is grounded in openness and transparency. And in the interests of openness and transparency, I will not, in principle, oppose the call for the public inquiry before us today. There are, however, just three points I would make in conclusion. I must reiterate my view that I see little in terms of what value will be added to the action taken to date and the action that I have pledged going forward and the live criminal investigation. In fact, it may serve only to divert more resources, more time and delay taking the critically important action needed to address this problem. If a public inquiry is to be established and be meaningful, it must go much wider than the legal landfill sites. It must include, as a couple of members have mentioned, fuel laundering and other waste crime and focus on the organised criminals behind it all. No stone must be left unturned. I hope, as I have said, that I will have the support of all in this House when I go to executive colleagues to seek the funding for this more comprehensive approach. I am mindful that the executive has already committed £1.5 million, which we have spent on removing any of the waste at Maboy, which posed an immediate health risk. And we have also employed 10 additional enforcement experts who are currently fighting waste crime across the north. In the interim, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will not sit on my hands and wait doing nothing. I will continue to drive forward the recommendations and change and learn the lessons outlined in the Independent Mills Report. Because, Mr Deputy Speaker, my message to the waste criminals is simple. And it's the same as your message to me. Your time is up. <laughs> well anticipated. I call Mr. Stephen Agnew to wind on the amendment. Mr. Agnew. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, I thank all speakers in the debate, um, including the minister who's just concluded uh, for their contributions. Um, a, a few members have noted Mr. McRae and, and Lord Morrow, and indeed the, the, the minister suggested if we were to have a public inquiry that the motion doesn't go far enough, and that was certainly the intention of the amendment to, to broaden it out, but other issues such as fuel laundering have been raised, and, and I would lend my support to those who, who would call for those wider issues to be included, waste crime, environmental crime, um, and organised crime's uh, involvement in these, these issues uh, must be investigated fully, and, and to quote the Minister, no stone must be left un, unturned. And a number of issues have been identified, um, many of them from the Mills report and uh, others besides. Um, the systematic failures that have led us here, the lack of enforcement of existing legislation, the problems of our existing structures and indeed as some have pointed out the, the failure of our judiciary um, to, to impose uh, sufficient sanctions to act as a real deterrent to these crimes. We, we have faced a number of problems. We need to take the measures um, to, to uh, prevent such crimes in the future, and I, I welcome the comments of both the Minister and Mr Eastwood to say that uh, these failures won't be allowed uh, to, to happen again, and, and I hope that transpires. And indeed, in that regard, I welcome the Minister's statement that I just picked up during his speech that um, Loch Ness, uh, uh, mineral extraction at Loch Ness is to be investigated, because again, it's been taking place unauthorised. So uh, I welcome the, 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 the Minister's announcement on that. Um, but we do have the issue of clean-up, um, which is no doubt going to be costly. And um, I thought my figure of $250 million was from the Mills report. I'll have to check it. So I didn't think it was an exaggeration. Um, but uh, I, I, I will check on that again. But regardless of cost, they're going to be significant. And um, we have to look at whether or not we can uh, recoup those costs. I think it's unlikely we'll recoup them all, and so we have to accept that there will be um, a cost to the public purse, um, if not, and uh, that is regrettable. And again, we must learn lessons from that. The debate about the the NCA um, 
has, has come up again. It, 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 it stretches into many different debates, but I, I think one clear thing we do have to look at um, as an issue for the, the, the police and, and the Justice Minister. In the absence of the National Crime Agency, what alternative does Northern Ireland have to fill that gap? Um, <clears throat> but it is regrettable that the, the predecessor to the NCA, SOCA, did not take uh, waste crime seriously. Again, Lord Morrow mentioned the motion doesn't go far enough, and I think in a speech there was a, a hint <coughs> that um, of not just organised crime but paramilitary crime and, and uh, the need to, to condemn and indeed uh, fully <coughs> pursue uh, paramilitary criminals, and he would certainly get my support for that and that of Green Party and I. And indeed, I welcome Lord Morrow's commitment to the protection of the environment, as he said, uh, all crime should be fully in investigated. Um, and I think it's right that we take environmental crime seriously, because on, on this issue, Mr. Eastwood pointed out that you know, this, this is the impact of this in his constituency on the wildlife and indeed the, the, the drinking water supplied to his constituents. And we, we should remember when we talk about the environment, it's not this abstract idea, but the environment is simply where we live from the house we live in <coughs> to the planet we live on. Um, I think the Minister made mention of better regulation, and I would say better regulation is regulation that includes enforcement, and I think that's what's been lacking, and that's what needs to follow. If the regulations can be improved, that's fantastic, but actually enforce the regulations we have, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll see improvements. Um, the, uh, the Minister raised the issue of, of retrospective planning applications, and it is true that, that there is certain uh, permission of develop, unauthorised development. But I think one thing that's clear that uh, the EIA directive does not allow um, development to take place before an environmental statement has been made and, and should not take place before uh, planning. Uh, permission is given, and I, I would urge the minister to, to, to look at this issue, because if he's to say that development on the scale of quarrying can take place, people will question whether development on the scale of fracking can take place without permission. And we need to ensure that large-scale development only takes. To conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. The last concluder, August Bemeg Lords, Erson and Molly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I will be speaking in, in, in favour of the, the motion and indeed in support of the amendment. I want to thank everyone who contributed to the debate. I think this is, has been both an important and sort of interesting debate, and indeed it is of obvious public interest. And whereas in, in, in real terms it may be situated in the northwest, it, from contributions today, it is obvious that there are implications throughout Ireland and beyond. I have absolutely no doubt in, in stating that the Minister is, is well aware of the concerns and the issues and the questions which uh, surround this whole matter. And indeed, I think his contribution today reinforced that. And I have absolutely no doubt that he's working very hard to try and come to, to grips with this. But I, I don't think it serves it well by saying that you know, we're questioning Sinn Féin's motivation in calling for uh, further inquiry or indeed whether or not they took a spotlight programme to bring it to our attention. I think uh, our members in the, in the committee were highlighting this well in advance of the Spotlight Programme, except to say that the Spotlight Programme did, in my opinion, uh, have an, a, an impact on public opinion and indeed on public confidence, and that's why I think the inquiry will, will be uh, of particular relevance. In opening the debate and proposing the motion, uh, Cahill Boylan did outline the many issues around this, uh, the implications of them of the Mulls report, which was a good report, and indeed the Spotlight programme, and all our members, when they made their contributions, obviously talked about it and talked about the Spotlight programme. In outlining the need for a public inquiry or an inquiry of, of beyond the, the inquiries that we had to date, it was about bringing clarity to the issue. I, I think none of us uh, you know, can argue, or I think we have to accept, that there is a degree of confusion still around this issue. Uh, I think there is ample space, and that space has been well sort of filled by people who continue to speculate about the nature of the problem, how the problem existed, and how it has been resolved. We have no issue in supporting 
the amendment, uh, you know, because I think that there, there may be other issues which need explored. But the reason why, if you like, we zeroed in in the North West is because, in our opinion, there has been good work done, but there's still part of the job to be completed. I, I think when people then, I mean, and we've had a wide range of things, but there's been suggestions that there should be, you no, know, this should be extended into fuel laundering. I think it was in the human trafficking, so you had a whole range. I know the minister obviously doesn't want to go into human trafficking, but there was a whole range of things. And the fear there is that sometimes the people, you know, we haven't had an examination of the NCA and its impact. Sometimes when you, there can be an inquiry into everything, but, but you achieve nothing. And I don't think any of us want to, to see that. I, I don't think in, in calling for uh, a public inquiry and, and the definition and the the style of inquiry is something which uh, can be negotiated out or, or discussed out. I don't think it undermines in any way what I would consider an excellent report by, 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 by the, Mr Mills. I think he delivered this in relation to the failings over many, many years. Uh, all our members have talked about, and indeed the Minister has talked about, the findings of that report. And indeed, I want to acknowledge the fact that the Minister is not standing in opposition of an inquiry and indeed is in line with the Solidarity City Council uh, approach to this, who also uh, have approved the need for further inquiry. Because, in fairness to the Mills report, I don't think the terms of reference were broad enough. No, and, and at a particular time, when the minister who set that report you know, set good terms of reference, and again, no one's doubting that, but I think even reading the report, uh, its ability to perhaps have witnesses beyond a certain department wasn't very clear. Indeed, a number of contributors, Mr Eastwood today mentioned and, and asked that someone else, there may be justice issues which you know, enter, were interwoven with this, but Mr Mills wouldn't have been allowed to perhaps speak. It's not clear from the report where he did or not. So all these things have an impact, and that's why we feel uh, that, that, that the, the inquiry, whatever the inquiry takes for him, should be broader and allow you to explore all those particular issues. And I'm very mindful that there is a, a PSNA uh, investigation, and no one, no one wants to uh, impinge upon that. But a criminal investigation, in this instance, and nearly by its very definition, will not tackle many of the issues. This is just looking more than that there was a criminal wrongdoing. Whereas we know from the Mills report, indeed, I suppose from local knowledge, there was many, many failings. Not all of them were criminally negligent, so therefore an inquiry will help us to do this. And I, I believe that the clarity required in this issue can only be uh, brought about. The Mills report and even the PSNA investigation uh, is, is site specific. It, it, it doesn't go beyond that. And I think it over a long number of years, uh, and I think we, we've seen that and that's confirmed, that there was opportunity after opportunity to try and prevent this from happening, but the, 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 the immediate and necessary steps weren't taken. And I think that's one of the issues which an inquiry can uh, explore, and that's despite the fact that there's evidence which has emerged that there were diligent officials, members of the public, who brought this to attention, and people should have acted accordingly, but they didn't. Indeed, today, I think in two contributions, I think Alban McGuinness and Ian Milne mentioned the issue of low-cost low tendering, um, and many people now are speculating that's perhaps one of the contributory causes to the, the whole issue. But perhaps there should have been something put in place when a council realised that if in year one uh, the tender was a certain amount, then year two the low test con uh, tender went well with below that, then why wasn't there a red flag system to try and bring it out? So I think the Mills report uh, in, in many ways achieved many things, but it didn't get to the, the core of the problem. I think there, there is questions to be asked when this should have been detected who should have detected it, and now what steps are put in place to ensure that it won't happen again. And not just that it won't happen again, but the people who are responsible are made aware that they failed in their, their responsibilities. And again, I don't think this should be a process where you're trying to seek out individuals to make them scapegoats, but whether there are failures in a system, whether there are failures in a process, then we have to ascertain how the system failed when it failed and who should be responsible to make it right. And that's the whole issue of accountability. None of us should be fearful of accountability. Accountability means that if people are responsible, then they're held responsible, and that responsibility is identified. And that stretches 
uh, right across. And, and whereas I don't want to be uh, progressing or, or taking this deb debate to the NCA, that's one of the issues about the NCA. Well, there's no accountability people can do and, and, and act in whatever way they, they feel like. And this here is a good case where, where people weren't held accountable, then they felt that they could do all that they wanted. So a number of people identified a number of specific incidents. Indeed, the minister himself has alluded to But one of the things that was missing in all of this, and one of the things that I think, that, and I think the minister has addressed as we go forward, is that the scrutiny wasn't what it should have been. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I think most people asked the question, how, how was it, or how is it, that you know, 500,000 tonne of waste was dumped and nobody seemed to notice. You know, it's not as if they say it was a, a small amount or uh, <clears throat> you, you know, an considerable amount. It was a massive amount, and yet no one seen it. The Spotlight Programme also identified a number of things. And, and again, I don't think the Mills report uh, actually got into it, but there were issues around uh, where there was actually physical structures appeared practically overnight on the site. No planning permission, yet there didn't seem to be any uh, approach where uh, anybody went and said, what's this about? And they didn't have had a went and asked that simple question. They might have found just a whole illegal dump at their midst. So that's, that's one of the reasons, because in our opinion, there are still questions which, which uh, need to be answered. You know, the minister, I mean, he would be aware that this, this is a big issue in, in around the North West, and indeed in particular. In, in Derry City. You know, it has filled social media sites. There has been all sorts of rumours and speculation. And I think that while that continues, then the clarity will not be, not, not be brought to this uh, particular issue. And, and one of the, the, the big issues which I think people are asking about, are there yet undetected uh, sites out there? The, the, there are many, many people who actually speculate, perhaps without foundation, but that's why I think an inquiry would, would highlight this. I would sure, yeah. thank the member for giving way, because I apologise that I haven't heard it. much of the debate by any means because I've been involved in other matters. But would the member agree that when it comes to this particular site, when it comes to other possible sites, the involvement of organised crime on the island of Ireland cannot be ruled out. Would he agree with me that the involvement of organised crime cannot be ruled out? I, I don't think anything can be ruled out, but the one thing I will say is that that's what the inquiry should establish. But <laughs> the question is that the amendment standing in the name of Mr Stephen Agnew be made. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The eyes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Again, the eyes have it.